right, looks like folks are still coming in, but I guess we can get started, right, Renee? Sure, let's go. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for uh, joining us today. You're only going to see me very briefly. My name is Ted Wells. I'm here for the sole purpose of introducing my esteemed colleague, Renee Aaron, who I've had the pleasure of working with for uh, just about two years now at STEM Connector. And um, Renee will be moderating today's discussion, uh, knowing the past opens doors to the future. And uh, we have a really amazing group of um, speakers, very informed and passionate. Um, so Renee, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Ted. Well, welcome everyone to today's featured webinar, Knowing the Past Opens Doors to the Future. And thank you for spending the next hour with us to unpack how historical representation plays a critical role in advancing Black and African Americans in STEM. I'm Renee Aaron, Partnership Specialist with STEM Connector, and it's an honor and privilege to moderate today's session with the following panel of scholars. Dr. Vimitra Alexander, STEM Education Specialist, Office of STEM Engagement at NASA. Dr. Robert Simmons, Head of Social Impact and STEM Programs at Micron Technology. Dr. Dawn Hearn Clark, Ass uh, Assistant Professor of History at Hillsborough Community College. Now, Black History Month is a time to reflect on our past and the progress we have made, but also a reminder of the work that still needs to be done. Today, we not only celebrate the Black astronauts, scientists, inventors, artists of the past, we also celebrate the rise of several programs and initiatives that will influence the future. Historical figures play a historical role in forming aspirations for young people as they look to their future studies and career paths. Unfortunately, the historical record that is presented to many students does not reflect the diversity of those whose contributions shape the world we live in today. As we celebrate Black History Month, this virtual event will examine how presenting students with historical figures can advance a sense of belonging and improve outcomes in STEM and other fields. So today's discussion explores how understanding Black and African-American history can shape learning outcomes, as well as increase awareness of instructional methods that leverage history, improve engagement of Black and African-American STEM in innovators. Now, lastly, we're gonna showcase how STEM funders can support inclusive approaches to history studies. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over to our panelists so that they can introduce themselves and share with you their current roles at their organizations. Who would like to go first? Um, I'll go first. Awesome. Uh, my name is Dawn Hurt Clark and I teach history at Hillsborough Community College in Tampa, Florida. Um, but prior to coming here, I spent um, a, a huge chunk of time at Fort Valley State University in Fort Valley, Georgia. Um, which is an 1890 land grant institution. Um, it's actually there where I became involved with STEM through that of agriculture, but from a historical perspective. Thank you. Demetra, would you like to go next? Sure, I'll go. I'm currently um, a program specialist for NASA um, here at Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. But previously I was an education specialist on the contractor side, but now I'm a civil servant. And prior to joining the team at NASA, I was at Mississippi State University as a director for K-12 Outreach in the Bagley College of Engineering. I'm super excited to be here. Hey everybody, Robert Simmons. Uh, I use he, him, his uh, pronouns. Uh, I am the head of social impact and STEM programs at uh, Micron uh, Technology. Um, have spent uh, my uh, career focusing on issues of equity in STEM um, and been a teacher, administrator, uh, professor. So just excited to uh, be in community with all of you, those that I can see on screen, uh, those that I not uh, I can't, um, because the work doesn't happen uh, uh, in isolation, it happens together. Thank you, panel. Before we jump in into the first question, 
let me just kind of share with the audience how to submit questions just in case you would like to include it um, during our webinar. Please use the chat feature below at the bottom toolbar. There's a chat and there's a Q&A. We're gonna focus on the chat feature for this webinar. All right, so let's just go right in and I'm gonna start with Dawn. Yes. You are the historian on this panel. Can you give our audience some background on Black History Month and how it became to be? Yes, it would be my pleasure. Um, as you all know, um, February is Black History Month. Um, it's actually going to be um, established um, as Negro History Week by Carter G. Woodson, um, who's the second African-American to earn a PhD from Harvard University behind that of W.B. Du Bois. And he's going to be a member of, at the time, um, and it still is one of the most prestigious historical associations, the American Historical Association, they allowed him to join, but they would not allow him to attend the annual conferences because of his race. So he's like, we really need to give scholarly study to the significance of folks of African descent um, really around the world. And so what you're gonna see in 1915, um, he's actually going to establish um, the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. Um, in 1916, um, he's actually going to establish the journal, um, the Journal of Negro History. Um, from that, it's gonna expand in 1926 to that of Negro History Week. Um, and then in 1970, 1976, America's Bicentennial, um, that's when it ends up becoming Black History Month. And since that time period, um, it's evolved and in 2023, 20, usually people say African-American History Month, but really acknowledging the contributions of African-Americans um, because for so long, they've been excluded from the dialogue. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that little fun fact history lesson, right? Um, I mean, we're coming up on 50 years, right? Since it was established as Black History Month. Almost, mm -hmm. wow, that's amazing. Well, everyone knows NASA, National Aeronautics and Space Administration. And we know that they have a plethora of K through 12 programs to teach and engage students about space. It's such an exciting time too, because Artemis and Webb are just a few of the programs that NASA features. Now, for Mitra, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna lie. I am over the moon and elated to see you, an African American woman, working at NASA and doing what you do. Can you provide your career journey at NASA for us, just to give us some context about your journey? Yes, ma'am. I can. Thank you, Renee, for that question. So. I'll first like to just start off by saying my journey to NASA has been quite unique. Totally out of the norm, out of the box. Very, very different. Um, just like you said, African-American, female, never even thought um, that I would be here. But like I mentioned in my introduction, um, I was the director of educational outreach and support programs at Mississippi State University from 2015 till about 2019 um, before I took the job with NASA as a contractor. But I wanna go back a little further since we're talking about history, right? So let me just take y'all back down the lane of Mitra's journey to NASA. Um, as an African-American female, I hope that this can motivate someone in the audience. So I never ever thought that I would be working as a contractor for the federal government. I didn't even know that was a thing. I had no idea, lack of resources. So, and I'll get to where I come from here in just a minute, but the lack of resources, just not even knowing. Now for me to be on the civil servant side of things, it's a complete dream. But I never had that on my plans. In my plan, it was never in my plans. I just didn't know that I could fit um, in the federal government period because my PhD is in social science and education. So I knew I needed to get to Huntsville. You may be wondering why does she need to get to Huntsville? I was newly engaged at the time. My husband, he's a he's a civil servant for the Department of Defense. He's an aerospace engineer. His PhD is in mechanical engineer. So I'm loving my job. I'm rocking my job. I'm doing outreach. I'm just loving it. But he loved his job. So like most women, okay, 
took that major, major, major leap of faith, not really wanting to leave my comfort zone. Remember, I didn't even think that I belong at NASA or the federal government. So I took that major leap of faith. I started applying for jobs, not wanting to leave, not wanting to leave Mississippi, okay? Mississippi out of all the places, I didn't want to leave. But I started applying for jobs um, in Huntsville, knowing that, oh, I'm just putting my name in the hat and it's so technical here. It's very competitive here. And lo and behold, um, I got asked to interview. So doing my interview, it was, it was different. The lady asked me, well, what do you know about NASA? I was very honest because in my previous job, I had no reason to use NASA resources. So I told her, I'm not familiar with these resources, but I'm willing to learn. And boy, did I think that I blew that um, part of the interview. So at this time, I'm like ready to end the interview because I just said, I don't know much about NASA, but you're interviewing for a NASA job. So you want to work for us. You don't know anything about NASA, but I was willing to learn. And I had to, I've learned a lot and I'm still learning. So I had to wait a couple of weeks um, to hear back from the job. And I heard back a few days later and I was offered the job. So now I'm totally shocked. I'm totally scared. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? Because I got to make a decision. I love my comfort zone. I'm in Mississippi. I'm from a small town place, raised by a single parent. I'm rocking it. I'm doing great. Got a PhD. I'm doing it, right? But I was, my, my comfort zone was shaking up. So I had to leave uh, Mississippi. But I didn't want to. I left my comfort zone. I took that giant leap into a very uncomfortable place. Like you said, being an African-American woman, suffering from that imposter syndrome, just being in a different space. I was a four-year academic All-American. I played college basketball, raised by a single parent from rural Mississippi, a small town called Crawford, Mississippi. But I knew my education was so important. Got four degrees. So I'm like, okay, I can do this. I can do this. Yet and still not just feeling that sense of belonging here at NASA. So I'm just from just just from those little small pieces, um, my journey to NASA was was totally different. It was different, but I would like to say to the people in the audience, no matter what you ever go through, be resilient, be confident in your belief in your beliefs, believe in yourself, be bold, take those initiatives. And I remember telling myself, Demetra, there aren't any elevators to success. You must climb the stairs, like one by one. Taking this job at NASA, you're in a total different space. You have to believe in you. My path was totally different. But again, like I said, my PhD is in instructional systems and workforce development. So I'm entering into this aviation, this space world. But I'm glad that I made that leap. And it has been a, a great journey. So love to share my story. Um, if you have any questions about my story, I can share it in the chat box, but I know we got other questions, but I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm a big part of this Artemis um, part program, Artemis project. Hopefully you all were able to see the launch back in November. So it's a great time to be working for a great agency. And I'll stop there, Renee, because I get super excited. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, Vimitra, you are my shero, okay? <laughs> so just, you know, just, listening to your story and 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 the the role that you play there at NASA I'm quite sure you have inspired so many younger kids um and and unfortunately you probably don't get or or gain access to their stories but I'm quite sure at that really foundational level you have inspired some kids to do the same thing and reach for the stars um, second question that I have for, for you, Vimitra, you know, NASA has a plethora of K through 12 programs. I know that is in your wheelhouse. That is your specialty um, mm -hmm. that has inspired and opened the minds of our younger generations that I just touched on. Um, can you share with some of the top K through 12 programs that target the underserved schools? Yes, ma'am. So we do. We have tons of programs and believe it or not, our programs are free. Like, I love to say, when I used to recruit for the university, if it's free, it's for me. So <laughs> I love, love, love free. Um, you know, just, just being able to soak it in, but as an educator, because that's what I did first. I taught first grade. So knowing that NASA, I didn't even think that NASA had activities and programs. And what I love about our programs, they are set aside. They have objectives. 
that are tied to national standards. So again, it's free and I do have some links that I have in, in, in some notes here. And I'm gonna drop those links in the chat box to share with you all. But I'll just share my top three because I know we're on the time crunch. So the first one um, that I talk about is called our NASA Astro Camp. Not sure if y'all heard about that. We have Human Exploration Rover Challenge. That's the second one that I talk about. And then I close out talking about our student lunch program. So with our NASA Astro Camp program, provides collaboration and opportunities for youth service organizations, museums, libraries, schools, and university. Um, it is an opportunity for all youth service organizations to bring NASA STEM engagement and science missions activities to second and 12th graders in their own communities. And again, it is free. I'm gonna drop some links, like I said, in, in the chat box. We have our Human Exploration Rover Challenge. And guess who's the new lead on that project? You. I am, I am, I am. I am. So excited. <laughs> um, I did robotics in my previous job, but um, here I'm getting to get back into that space of robotics and it's, it's just so exciting. But I'm the lead on this project um, for NASA. So I, we call it HERC, but it's Human Exploration Rover Challenge. And it features an engineering design challenge to engage students in the next phase of human space exploration. Who don't want to be a part of that? Who don't want to be a part of that? So the annual event, it challenges our students to create a human powered vehicle designed to navigate and simulate a surface of another world. And so we, we make that happen right here in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, the student team designs, they build and they test technologies that enable rovers to perform in a variety of environments. This opportunity is open to high school students and college students um, worldwide. Like we have international teams and we have teams um, from the US. So the third one that I highlight is called Student Launch, which is research-based. It's a research-based competitive exper experiential um, exploration activity. It strives to provide relevant cost-effective research and development of rocket propulsion systems. Who would not want to be a part of it? Um, of course, this project offers multiple challenges, reaching a broad audience of middle high school students, colleges, and universities across the nation. So the last couple of years, our student challenges have placed a tremendous amount of emphasis on increasing opportunities for underserved schools. So there's a whole communication plan that's geared towards broadening underserved student participation in STEM, and this can ultimately help impact the STEM community and our NASA workforce. And now that a new lead is on board, of course, I'm pushing for more diversity in our student challenges because I do understand it has been a challenge in terms of getting more underserved, more underrepresented students involved. So I'm passionate about that. I'm going to drive that message home. I'll be out recruiting at schools, I'm just trying to get more people involved. We're going to help them but we at least need them to be at the table. But how do you get the people at the table? You gotta go knocking on some doors. So I'm super excited um, to be the lead of those projects that are upcoming. So I hush, I hush Renee, cause I love to talk. <laughs> Listen, I am just over the moon, um, just, just trying to wrap my head around these programs that you're launching and that you're spearheading. Like, I don't think you're going to have to knock on too many doors. Okay. Um, I think I, I think people are going to start to call you. <laughs> I, and I'm, and I'm ready. Out. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. And, and sometimes people just don't know what we have. Absolutely. Um, like I say, the it's website it is it's is it's difficult. Um, the website is a little challenging. But I'm going to drop some direct links. I'm um, in the chat box here in a few minutes. But I'm here to help. I want to see more, more, and more students get involved because these programs can really and truly help. Wow. Well, I appreciate you dropping those personal um, links in there because, again, sometimes the websites could could be overwhelming for information. Um, so, including your links that you just mentioned, please drop that in the chat for our audience mm -hmm. to follow up and to reach out to you because I'm quite sure you know we're gearing up for the summer, right? Um, and we have to definitely plan accordingly and making sure that that every child has an opportunity to um, participate, right? Mm -hmm. um, this leads me to uh, pulling Robert into this conversation. You're an educator, a career educator, who while continuing to teach 
has moved into a role of advancing social impact for one of the most innovative companies in the world that has committed to advancing social justice in STEM. You have moved into this role of funder and is committed to leveraging Micron's resources to advance Black and African Americans in STEM. Can you talk about some of the programs Micron is funding to engage Black students in STEM? Yeah, I mean, first want to give a shout out to uh, Vavitra, just because, I mean, hearing, seeing her at NASA um, on the shoulders of those who came before her, uh, thinking about hidden figures, uh, but also just the ancestors. Uh, so just want to bring the ancestors into the space as we think about Black history um, and uh, think about it from a very diasporic standpoint. Um, I think, you know, when I think about the work at Micron, uh, we are very unapologetic about supporting um, uh, Black students. Um, as a matter of fact, um, we um, took a major leap um, to uh, begin to expand our work outside of, of Boise, Idaho, and build on the foundation uh, that had already been laid um, to think about communities that uh, were going to significantly benefit. And one of the first things that um, we did was to expand our work in deep partnership with Norfolk State University um, with two of our most significant programs, Girls Going Tech and Chip Camp. Uh, and uh, it's, it's an amazing thing to see when I think about Girls Going Tech, um, to see the various ways that these Black girls show up with the various hairstyles, uh, the various ways in which they think about the world and just their general excitement about STEM. And I think that um, not only uh, did they show up, but there was overwhelming interest in participating in uh, this work. And I think it speaks to um, reframing a narrative in particular for black women and girls that uh, they aren't interested in STEM. Um, and, you know, and I think that uh, it's important to through the work that we do at Micron, through our programming, both Girls Going Tech, Chip Camp, and now Chip Camp Junior uh, for younger students, it's really important to make sure that as a company um, and as a foundation that we're taking programs to communities that are historically underserved, um, in particular as it relates to Black folks, right? It's not enough to say we believe in it, but we have to actually go um, to Norfolk State University. We have to go to the city of Syracuse, uh, which has the highest child poverty rate for any city in America, over 100,000 people, which most people don't realize. We have to think about doing these programs in the District of Columbia, uh, which still, contrary to what, what the popular opinion, is still Chocolate City to me because of the legacy that Black folks have created um, in the District of Columbia. But also thinking about uh, Atlanta, when we launched chip camp last summer um you know uh we had never done it in atlanta and you know the team said no problem i i know what the mission is and why we're doing this um and this was supported from our ceo sanjay marotra uh the president of the foundation april arns and, and our executive director d mooney where they were like yes this is the right thing to do and not only did we host it with um, all black kids, there was one uh, non-black kid, um, but we hosted it on the historic West End of Atlanta. Like we weren't tinkering around the edges, but we believed that we had to take it to them. Like, and you know, no shade to Georgia Tech and we could have done it at Georgia Tech, but we didn't. We decided that we were gonna do this in their community, in their backyard, in a place that they felt comfortable and safe. And certainly we partner with Georgia Tech and the kids this summer will go to Georgia Tech but we believe that it's important to do it right there. This summer, as, as a to build on what Dawn said, understanding our history is something that people oftentimes forget in STEM and how it intersects with the social sector, key pieces of social impact. We're actually doing it in partnership with uh, the steam truck, which is led by a black woman, uh, Marsha Francis. And not only that, we're doing it at a space in Atlanta adjacent from the AUC, because we want those young people to look out the window when they're at chip camp in Atlanta, Georgia, to see what the ancestors left for them, to see uh, what their elders created for them um, at the Atlanta University Center, which has created some of the brightest minds, not just in tech or in STEM, uh, but just in society and leading social change um, in our community. So we're super excited, but I also wanna just say that 
uh, one of the other ways that we're doing this is thinking about as a funder, how do we support organizations led by uh, Black folks and organizations that explicitly say our mission is to support Black people, right? Not an organization that says we're going to support diverse people. No, 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 no. Like that's cool. But I also want to be able to engage with organizations like the Hidden Genius Project, which we funded, STEM from Dance, uh, which focuses on Black and Latinx girls. Um, and I think this level of, of, of being explicit about it allows for an unapologetic commitment um, to Black people. Um, and the last, last thing I'll say, Renee, is that as a foundation, we push the boundary when I think about what does it take to do this um, in a way that is uh, allowing for the justice conditions that we aim to change to be the justice conditions that we operate from as a baseline. So we've, uh, we're partnering um, to build out a collaborative philanthropic effort to not just provide uh, programming, which I'll talk about in a second in the city of Syracuse, but we're also doing this because we wanna find pathways for young people to not engage with behavior on the block, which we know for a significant number of black youth growing up in urban America happens in the summer disproportionately. So we're gonna work to provide uh, six weeks of uh, summer programming uh, with, my, with the Micron Foundation, Syracuse University, uh, the Allen Foundation, Gifford Foundation and the United Way um, and the Community Foundation collectively we believe in supporting um, uh, Black girls in this particular case, and we're going to bring uh, STEM from dance um, to Syracuse University, um, to uh, Syracuse as a community, um, and we're going to run two cohorts. Normally, communities do this in one cohort, but because we collaborated together, and it's not about putting a Micron logo on it, it's not about the Allen Foundation logo on it, it's just to suggest, okay, we need to do this together because no foundation can solve all of the problems, just like no nonprofit can solve all of the challenge, uh, challenges in a community or create enough opportunity. So we're excited. Uh, we launched the Georgetown Nonprofit Leaders of Color Fellowship Program because aside from just supporting um, Black students, we also want to support nonprofit leaders of color who are doing this work. Um, and one of our key pillars of that is uh, those who are working um, in the STEM space. Um, and, you know, excited to say that. Um, we had such leaders as Calvin Mackey from STEM NOLA as a part of the fellowship. Uh, some of the amazing work that Marsha Francis is doing as well as some of the work that Heather uh, Harrison is doing as the executive director of Girls Inc. here in DC, uh, where you know, in Girls Inc. DC in particular, they actively support uh, uh, black girls um, and shout out to the work that uh, they're doing at the Hidden Genius Project in, uh, in Oakland as well to support black boys. Well, Listen, Micron is definitely providing a rich and unforgettable summer learning experience for African-Americans, which yeah. exposes those students to a new world of opportunities in STEM. I mean, I love the idea of taking it to the community. I think sometimes we focus more on, we have to hold it at a educational institution or anything like that. Um, I think reaching out directly and hosting it in the community makes a huge impact, a direct impact. Mm -hmm. um, and it speaks volumes in the community and, and to all the other folks that play a part in supporting children, right? I mean, it's the whole community, it's a whole um, effort, right? So mm -hmm. I, I love that. And I love the fact that you talked about and touched on the executive certifications for nonprofits, right? Like. I think sometimes we miss opportunities uh, for certain critical groups of folks that really need that support. So love that additional program. Is it really, and, and I have a question for you, Robert, about the programs that you just uh, mentioned, Girls Go in Tech, CHIP Camp in Atlanta. I mean, I'm excited and I just wanna be a kid again, right? But I'll tell you, is it a situation where you have to turn away folks or put them on a wait list? I'm just interested because the programs that you are talking about are yep. necessary, but I want to make sure that yep. you're not turning away folks. Yeah, I mean, I think um, every year we we have a capacity, right? When we did the uh, Girls Going Tech at Norfolk State University, um, I think we uh, had 200 slots, but 700 girls who were interested, right? 
And so I think this is where a scaffolded approach to community-based STEM education is important. And we need to think about if Micron is gonna offer Girls Going Tech in Atlanta, and we have 50 girls that can't participate, how can we as a funder either work with other funders or fund it ourselves for those interested girls to have something else to do connected to STEM during that time period? Or can we trade off if they're running a program on Tuesday, can we have, can we run a program on Tuesday and then say, okay, on Wednesday, we'll have your 50 girls come to Girls Going Tech and the 50 girls that are here uh, are gonna go to, to, to your program. So I think that part of the challenge in doing, in particular, when you think about STEM education with a community lens, is that people live in these silos um, for a whole host of reasons. And, and oftentimes it's, it, I find it interesting that um, in STEM education, where you think that we're, we are where we are with technology because of creativity, people taking risk and innovation and just being super creative and doing less with more and all these other things. But oftentimes from a programming perspective and a collaborative perspective, people don't wanna do that, right? They don't wanna evolve their programs. They don't necessarily want to do anything different. So it's really important um, and my challenge to the STEM education community is that we gotta get out of the rinse and repeat right? Mm -hmm. Like this is what we did two years ago. And like, we're going to keep doing the same thing because society evolves, the needs of kids evolve. Uh, and so I think there's a need uh, in the STEM education community. And I know that I talked to uh, Marsha Francis at Steam Truck and Heather Harrison at um, uh, yeah. Girls Inc. often about this. Um, and shout out to my colleague, uh, Nicole over at uh, TechBridge Girls, because they're doing some super dope work an amazing work and we provided funding to support them. Uh, and, uh, and the last thing I'll say about that is that we need to find unconventional ways to do this work. Right now we're working on a partnership with the Center for Black Educator Development and they run something called Freedom Schools uh, in Philadelphia and other parts of the, of the uh, country. What does it look like for STEM programs to actually be run and informed by the needs of the community in other spaces that aren't necessarily STEM centric, right? But kids are there. So let's do a program with them. And so I've had conversations with my brother Sharif El Meki um, at the Center for Black Educator Development about how do we do this through the Freedom School model. And, and Dawn would appreciate this is that if we really want to think about educating uh, Black children, we need to go back to our roots. And one of the core principles of educating uh, Black children in particular is the utility of freedom schools, right? Freedom schools that didn't just have trained mm -hmm. educators in them, but trained others who were in there to uh, provide knowledge, wisdom, and insight. So I think uh, excited to see how that plays out with the Center for Black Educator Development. Uh, we supported the um, uh, convening of Black teachers and we hosted a strand with them around uh, what is the role of Black male STEM teachers um, oh. kind of operating at the intersection of teacher diversity and STEM. And so I, I just think that mm -hmm. we have to come outside of our box in STEM education and work with other people. We need to go to conferences that aren't simply on STEM education. We need to go to conferences that are on culturally relevant pedagogy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, so that we can understand the ways in which cultural context should be built into the way in which we design a uh, STEM curriculum. So that's some of the work that uh, that I'm excited about, but also the ways in which I think, um, you know, at Micron, we can't, we can't, uh, we're going to have waiting lists. And that's something that keeps me up at night um, mm -hmm. because I haven't quite figured out how to solve for that because it's also a space issue like that. And that that is something that just keeps me up at night because that means that while we're aiming to provide access and opportunity, there's something about our design that limits access and opportunity because of capacity, because of size, that's not necessarily a byproduct of our commitment, but it's a byproduct of the social conditions that we have to operate in. So I think it requires a village uh, to solve for that. Indeed. Well, thank you so much for dropping so many golden nuggets, Robert. Awesome. So I'm gonna switch gears real quick. I'm gonna take my question back to Dawn. You've completed some extensive research throughout the years. How did you include African-American history to your research to engage students? And specifically, we know that you've been doing research around the work of uh, 
extension agents in conjunction with the ham and egg show at Fort Valley State University. It's an 1890 historical black land grant institution. Can you speak to how integrating this history into your course help engage your students more deeply in, in, in learning and that research project piece? Yes, I would love to. Um, I spent about 10 years of my career at Fort Valley State University. And uh, when I went there, I was, you know, I, I, I do African American history. Um, but I will say a challenge for many historians is finding funding for your research. Because if you're to research one institution, um, you know, you have two, two teaching load, you know, tons of grant assistance to assist you with your research and everything's great. However, everybody can't be at those institutions. Mm -hmm. And so at Fort Valley, I was looking around for funding for my research and my research agenda had been on rural Georgia, but it had included agriculture. And so everyone's like, oh, the College of Ag has money. So I was like, okay, I'll do the College of Agriculture. And then I discovered this topic, um, the Fort Valley Ham and Egg Show. And the Fort Valley Ham and Egg Show has blossomed um, into a really fruitful research topic. Um, but it's a research topic that I've been able to bring my students along with me, um, leading to publications. Um, Vermita, you said Mississippi State. I have one of my former students who's pursuing her, her doctorate, um, Kaimara Sneed um, at Mississippi State um, in ag history. And it was because of how I basically framed it to her as an undergrad at Fort Valley. Um, and she's doing really exciting things. I actually saw one of my former students at Fort Valley who's on this chat. Um, I kept pushing her and pushing her, um, Elena Cheney. Um, she's at University of California, Davis, um, working on her dissertation, or working on her doctorate. But I was always pushing them like, you can do more, you can do more. But what you have to do to help engage students with research is have it become relevant to them. Have it become relevant to them. So I was doing this research on the Fort Valley Ham and Egg Show. My goal, um, I taught a class on oil and family history. And so what I did was I got my students to go out into the community and interview folks who had participated in the Fort Valley Ham and Egg Show. Um, the students became elated. The community loved the project. Um, I don't know if folks are familiar with the, the town gown relationship. Oftentimes, when you have institutional higher education in the local community, there's sometimes distance between it. Um, by having the students go out in the community and interview basically their elders about this premier extension program, um, it got the community excited. It got the students excited. And I will say a little about the Fort Valley Ham and Egg Show. Um, it was started in 1916. Um, by a home demonstration agent, an extension agent, um, Otis O'Neill and his wife, Jeannie O'Neill. So they're both an extension. But why they got involved in the project is African-Americans were going into extreme debt um, because they didn't have the ability to properly preserve their own food. Um, they would go in rural Georgia and import meat from Chicago at these incredibly high interest rates. Um, so they ended up in debt. Um, sometimes they didn't even have enough food. And so he's like, you're, you're basically Otis and Jeannie, you're in middle Georgia, um, also referred to as the black belt. Um, you have land, you have access to materials. And so how can we leverage this and, and really teach them how they had the ability to do so? And what happened with Otis O'Neill, he actually saw a really successful black farmer. And he was like, can I invite folks to your farm to see what you're doing? And he was like, no, because these folks are going to come back and steal my meat. Um, and so he's like, if I take the knowledge that he has, and I've shared with others, and bring it to campus, then you could invite the entire community. So it started in 1916, um, going out in the community, teaching about domestic science and agricultural science. Um, it ends up becoming an internationally known festival. I was actually doing the research going through microfilm um, for extension records, and a woman in Italy said Margaret Toomer was going to be a home demonstration agent, money to help with the preservation of eggs. So you want purebred chickens, so you have better eggs. Um, so auctioning off to the community, but all kinds of things they're going to learn from the ham and egg show. So it's going to deal with food insecurity, which we call it now. Um, but also lead to um, African-American home ownership. They had sessions about that, teaching Black folks how to keep their farm, um, teaching, because it's going to tend to be gendered, women how to care for the health of their kids. Um, and with the funds they made from their newfound 
um, experiences with the ham and egg show because what they would do is they would auction off the ham and eggs to local community leaders and they would buy them. Um, you know, things like pay for their kids to go to school, um, pay to have the ability to go to see a physician, when oftentimes in rural communities, that's not the case. So it's really going to transform the lives of people in the community. But I got my students to engage in the research. So the community was excited. And when the students saw themselves doing work that, um, for example, George Washington Carver, he's going to come and judge the ham and egg show. Um, from the ham and egg show, they had a folk festival. Zora Neale Hurston's going to come and judge that. So having students see folks who they're familiar with from historical purposes that they were at Fort Valley and they were helping to improve the community, the students actually took more pride in the school. So they knew they went to Fort Valley, but knowing the history, they really didn't know. It got the community engaged, it got the students engaged. And from that, I have students working on their doctorates. So um, I'm proud. I'm proud. Awesome. I, I mean, stories like that are just valuable to hear and just just it it kind of puts this fire in my belly right to want to do something and 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 to talk about it and to engage with our our younger generation to share these stories um so thank you for bringing some context around the ham and egg show in fort valley state university and this extensive research that you you got some of our uh students engaged with so appreciate that now Demetra, I'm, I'm going back to you. You've been at NASA working directly with students and engaging them in STEM education. Historical figures help students find identity and meaning as they pursue STEM studies. Um, we also know that many prominent African-Americans contributed to NASA's success. Nowadays, when I hear NASA, my mind automatically shifts to the movie Hidden Figures. Before the movie, if anyone would have told me that three notable African-American women worked at NASA, but were the brains behind the astronaut John Glenn's orbit mission, I would have never believed them. Can you speak on how NASA incorporates history into STEM outreach and why it's so important? Yes, ma'am. I sure can. Um, this is one of my favorite moves too. So I don't even have to mention it in, in my in my little response. So um, let me see how I want to frame this from a historical perspective. Um, at NASA, of course, I'm an educator, right? So I'm all for all things educators. We do have educational toolkit um that I love to share, and I do have a special one. And I was waiting. I was waiting to put this one in the chat box. So. I'm going to place the link in the chat box soon as I finish talking about it. But we do have educational toolkits to help us continue um, being able to just spread that legacy, being able to just spread the knowledge of our historical peace that we hold so dear and near to our hearts. Um, because we do try to incorporate, and I, I know I do, when I go out and give presentations, we try to incorporate our history into our STEM education or STEM engagement or STEM outreach efforts. So one of my favorite ones that I love to share with educators and students, um, of course, is called the NASA Modern Figures, right? But it is deeply rooted in hidden figures. So I'm going I'm to tell you all about that in just a little bit. I'm going to drop the link in the chat box because it is worth looking at. I already put the link in there for the first novel for the woman, the first woman novel. It's a great resource. But anyway, I can go on and talk about that all day. So our NASA Modern Figures Toolkit, it includes um, articles activities, videos, and games that highlight those historical figures and STEM materials for both educators and students in grades K through 12. So even if you are a college student and you just want to stay in the know, you can tap into this toolkit because it does bring our historical figures back into this, into this modern place that we're in today. Um, our content does a great job of aligning, like I was mentioning earlier, to educational standards because sometimes teachers need to know how does this align to the NGS standards? Well, if your state have a different standard, you have to make it fit your state standard. But we do give you that push. Uh, we, we give you the guide so you can take these materials and use them in your classroom the next day. So I'm gonna make sure that I share that. But uh, one way educators can bring Katherine Johnson inspiring story to the classroom is through our NASA Modern Figures Toolkit. 
it is phenomenal. It is to me, it's very, very important. Um, I know this kind of cliche, so I'm trying to preface how I see it. You know, representation matters, right? It just simply put, representation, it matters. If a student, and Don hit on this a few minutes ago, if a student can see a person that looks like them, that is motivation. And it will spark that student interest um, to pursue a STEM career. But again, representation, it matters. It, it, it matters. And I know we say it all the time, but it really and truly does matter. So um, more importantly, I do want to share this from my personal experience when I was at Mississippi State as a director. My office stayed full with students. Um, I engaged students, faculty, and staff members because those students needed to see somebody that just looked like them. They needed to be able to vent. They needed a mentor. They needed advice. They needed guidance. And so I love being able to be that person um, for students, but just reminding them that you can get through this because a lot of times we have students in these programs, we have students just signing up for research and they really don't know what they're getting into. But having a person that looks like them, somebody that they can relate to, somebody they can talk to, it matters. But um, I do like to push that NASA Modern Figures Toolkit. And it is a great way to bring it back full circle um, to incorporate Katherine Johnson and all of our great women um, into the classroom. And I saved that link. I was holding on to it. I dropped <laughs> the link um, directly into the chat box where you can go directly to um, this particular um, resource. And again, it's free. And if you have any questions, any, absolutely any questions about any of the resources that are placed in the chat box, just ask. That's what I love to do. I love to help educators, future educators. It doesn't matter, informal, formal, museums, organizations, I just love helping um, others. So I hush, I hush, and I'm gonna drop the link in the chat box. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. And I'm quite sure our audience appreciates the willingness to um, add your links. So therefore they could go straight to the source of what you're talking about and, and dropping those golden nuggets. Now I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna lean back into Robert real quick because Micron is one of the most innovative companies in the world, right? And you talked about some great programs that you're funding, but tell, can, can you share with the audience um, your approach to funding and how others could maybe use this as a model? Um, yeah. is, is, is it certain programs that kind of piqued your interest? Uh, are you focused on, you know, how do you vet them? Yeah, I think that in general, philanthropy needs to be do a better job of being more transparent, because I think there's this kind of uh, code of secrecy and like a lack of transparency in philanthropy. And I think that, um, you know, we continue to uh, work on that uh, through our social impact work, uh, make our presence more visible nationally so people know that we exist. But we also will talk to anybody. But also, I always say to folks, like, I'll tell you what we fund and don't fund. Uh, based on our strategic priority, but I will also say, let me introduce you to somebody who does that. And I think that's the missing element of philanthropy um, is, is that second or third introduction for a organization that uh, uh, they may be interested in. Uh, the other thing I think uh, the way um, I think about funding is what what is the impact that it will have in a quantitative or qualitative way on the lives of young people, right? I think that far too often when people uh, in philanthropy talk about this stuff, they get it, they get stuck in this quantitative space um, mm -hmm. of thinking about, oh, well, you served 500 students. Yeah, and that may be good, but did the kids actually have a good time? Did they um, actually feel good about uh, their racial identity development when I think about black kids, right? And I think there's some nuance uh, to it. Um, and I always leverage uh, the fact that I wasn't raised professionally in corporate America, right? So I spent time at the Campaign for Black Male Achievement, spent time leading schools, spent time working with Share Our Strength. So I've spent a lot of my career in the space, not as a, um, a funder. Um, I was at the Campaign for Black Male Achievement when we were connected to the Open Society Foundation as a funder, but I've spent the majority of my career on the other side of the table doing the work. Um, and I think that for me, trying to be very transparent uh, is super important um, in our phil philanthropic work, but also leveraging our philanthropic partners um, to make sure that um, we work with them on programs that we run and paying them the administrative costs 
to help us facilitate it. So we do steam truck or we work with uh, steam truck in Atlanta to host chip camp. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're our partner. Like they're not a grantee necessarily. I mean, we do pay them, but we also recognize that their thought partnership helps us be better as a program. And I mm -hmm. think it's important for me. I, I always try to listen to uh, those in the social sector about ways that can help us be better in our philanthropic support. And one of the things that I've tried to do is make it clear that um, the path to social justice in philanthropy is through multi-year unrestricted funds, mm. right? And I think far too often folks in philanthropy want to give you money to solve generational problems and then come back and say, well, why didn't you solve it? Well, you operate, you can't solve generational problems uh, in particular, when we're talking about uh, the Black community and the ways in which Black folks have been marginalized in STEM and society on a three-year funding cycle. It just doesn't work that way, yeah. right? And so I think that there's that. And the last thing I'll say is that it's incumbent on those who aren't from the Black community but are interested in supporting uh, Black leaders and issues in the Black community to listen to Black people. Right. And I think that there's oftentimes this um, in philanthropic conversations with other foundations, there's almost this like, oh, well, we know all the answers mm -hmm. because we've been funding X, Y, and Z. But in fact, those who are most proximate to the pain, oppression, and opportunity and the beauty of Blackness, those are the people who actually understand the Black experience in America uh, in a very nuanced and, uh, and, and amazing uh, way. So I think that it's about being proximate but also being open to listen. Um, and, and, you know, and quite frankly, I, I always challenge my team that yes, we do chip camp or we do girls going tech, but where girls going tech looks like in Idaho, that's not what girls going tech should look like in, in Atlanta because context is different. It doesn't mean that the content is bad. It just means that when building STEM, we also have to consider culture and context and history. Uh, so I think that, um, you know, that's uh, super uh, critical uh, to the work. Indeed, indeed. Clearly, Micron has the right person leading the charge to improve the world by addressing social issues Thank and funding so high impact programs with impressive outcomes for our youth, right? I mean, clearly, you said it best, Robert. I mean- Thank you so much. Overall, um, we're, we're like five minutes away to closing. And before I do that, I would like to open the floor to the audience to maybe add a few questions for the panelists um, in the chat real quick. Um, other than that, um, we can start moving in, in the phase of me sharing some of the takeaways from this particular webinar today. So I'm going to give a few seconds and my colleagues are actually going to forward uh, your questions to me if you have any available. And I don't see anything coming across yet. Renee, I see a hand up from Steph Davis. Okay. Uh, Steph, if you could type your chat and into the chat box, that would be great. Okay. Is it coming through? I don't see it yet, but if you just want to wrap up, Renee, we can. Okay, well, why don't I do this? Um, before I kind of share some of the takeaways from this webinar, can can we just get some closing remarks from our panelists? Um, Dawn, would you like to go first? Um, I would love to go first. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna say engaging students in research. And these are undergraduate students. So these aren't masters or doctorate students. Um, also students, because I taught African-American history, a lot of folks would just take my classes, but they weren't history majors. Um, I've been really successful with helping them learn to appreciate history, um, to engage in history, to become active historians. So folks who never thought they could, but the project with the ham and egg show, um, a challenge that I would like to do in um, both panelists have been, or everybody's mentioned 10, 10 Figures, which is one of my favorite movies. Um, actually, a woman from Fort Valley, Georgia is in Hidden Figures, and she's 
good friend of mine. Um, we want to turn the ham and egg show into a documentary. And so for folks, um, who, if you're in STEM, kind of, a, I guess, a strict view of STEM, funding's more available for folks who do the history of STEM, not necessarily so much. Um, so finding resources, but really, really taking the time to engage your students. Um, you'll be surprised what folks can do, um, especially when they see it relevant in their lives when they see folks who are practicing who look like them, um, you have the ability to help transform the futures. Awesome. Demetra? Um, sure thing. I will just add, let's see. So I've already told you all about the elevators. You know, just don't even look for the easy way out. Sometimes it's okay. A lot of times it is truly, truly okay. But the thing that I would like to leave um, and I see some students in, in this space, so I have to say it. I'm just reiterating, be confident in your abilities. Believe in yourself like none other. Um, be resilient, be bold, take those initiatives. You know, just don't be afraid. If you're gonna do it, do it scared. And nobody has to know that you're doing it scared, but you have to do it. Um, and I always tell my little nephews, I tell my family members, uh, make sure, it doesn't matter what you get your degree in. Because I, I, I talk to my husband all the time. I need to go get this engineering degree. He's like, no, you don't. You're fine. Just make sure you get a degree or gain some type of skills that are transferable. Um, and I, 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 I'll leave with that. Make sure you gain some transferable skills. Um, but do it. Do it scared. Do it afraid. Just do it. Make it happen. Thank you for those encouraging yes, words. And Robert? Yeah, I'll close with uh, uh, one of the greatest scholars on Black folks of our lifetime, the late, great, notorious B.I.G. Um, mm. Biggie, Biggie said it was all a dream. I used to read Word Up magazine, so on and so on and so forth. And, and what I hope people take away from this, and particularly young people, is that um, if you dream it, you can do it. Um, but along the way, you, you, you have to, you know, do the thing sometimes. You have to work in the cafeteria. You have to work fast foods. You have to work an extra job. You may have to stay up extra to study because nobody's going to hand you anything. And in fact, people already question our humanity as Black folks, right? They, they, they do this on a consistent basis. Um, and I just think that the ability to dream with our eyes closed and our eyes wide open is super important for young people, right? And the ability to dream allows us to see what's possible, but also uh, to, to dream of the things that uh, make the ancestors proud. And so I'll just close with the idea of dreaming um, because it's that dream that allows you to chase things that, you know, your parents, our grandparents, our ancestors could only imagine for us when they sat in the fields and the cotton fields, in my case, in Mississippi and Georgia um, and Tennessee, where my grandmother and my grandfather are from, and just looked at the clouds while they picked cotton they had dreams and That's it's right. important that we take a step back have those dreams and oftentimes just sit in silence while we figure it out so I'll stop there thank you so much in honor of the significant contributions made by diverse communities stem connector is actually launching a series of insight release to celebrate diversity equity inclusion uh, accessibility and what we're trying to do is make sure that we have this material available, um, acknowledging these groups' contributions. Um, one pager is available for all attendees. We're actually putting it in the chat so you can actually download it and take that um, away from this particular webinar today. So next month is International Women's Month. I will be remiss if I do not provide a shameless plug for the Million Women Mentors. Uh, they'll be delivering a dynamic webinar on how state, national, and international leaders in PepsiCo, P&G, and Women in Insurance Initiative will be advancing and embracing equity for girls and women in STEM fields on March 8th at 2 p.m. Please register today. You'll see the link in the chat. It was a pleasure to have you with us today, and this concludes the webinar. Thank you all for attending. We hope you learned and enjoyed today's presentation. Thank you, Dr. Heard Clark, 
Dr. Vimitra Alexander and Dr. Robert Simmons for providing us with a fantastic, impactful conversation. Have an amazing rest of the week, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.